started. Uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, we're very pleased to have CIDA alum Francois Foucault with us. Um, Francois is an associate professor at the University of New Hampshire, where he's been since uh, 2017. Uh, he obtained his PhD from Cornell in 2011 and then went on to postdoctoral appointments here at CIDA and at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, he's an expert on neutron star merger simulations, uh, and that's what he'll be speaking about today. So Francois, welcome. Please take it away. Thank you, uh, and thank you for inviting me back here. Back. Uh, so yeah, in this presentation, I'd like to discuss uh, some of the issues that are currently related to the modeling of neutron star mergers, and more specifically, uh, the uh, electromagnetic emission that follow these mergers and the uh, nuclear synthesis that happens as a result of these mergers. And when I say neutron star mergers here, by the way, I would mean both uh, neutron star neutron star binaries and neutron star black hole binaries. So two of the three uh, types of systems that have been detected through gravitational waves so far, uh, the third being, of course, the most commonly detected, the binary black hole uh, case. Uh, and there will be largely three parts to this talk. I'll start with kind of an overview of the important physics in these systems. Uh, and then uh, I will move to how much we do and do not understand at the moment the matter R flows generated by neutron star mergers, because we will see from, from these matter R flows is you know, where most of the electromagnetic emission uh, comes from, and also you know, where nuclear synthesis is happening. Uh, so that's what we need to model in order to figure out what this looks like. And then in the last part of the talk, at least uh, time permitting, I'll talk a little bit about uh, neutrino transport because neutrinos are crucial to understand nuclear synthesis in these uh, mergers. Uh, and some of the techniques that are currently used to uh, do to solve the problem of neutrino transport in simulations. And I think we'll talk a lot more about that actually tomorrow at like three. Is it? Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, when I'll probably give a bit more technical details there, I guess. <laughs> Okay, so before uh, getting into uh, any of that, let me quickly remind you of you know, the kind of physics that we are interested in studying through neutron star mergers. Uh, so broadly speaking, you know, because these are extremely compact objects colliding with each other, there are two very important areas of physics that we can directly study. One is gravity and the other one is the range of topics in nuclear physics. Uh, of course, uh, we can constrain any theories of gravity or, or general relativity or anything beyond that using uh, particle gravitational waves coming from these systems. And that's true whether you have a neutron star or not. Uh, and uh, for that, we actually need decent models of the gravitational wave signals uh, of uh, neutron star, neutron star, neutron star, black hole, black hole, black hole binaries uh, in GR, if you want it as GR, and ideally also with theories beyond that. So that's not something that I'm going to talk too much about here. Uh, from the point of view of uh, nuclear physics, there are uh, two uh, specific uh, aspects I'm going to talk about here. Uh, one is that we would like to use neutron star merger to constrain the equation of state of very dense neutron rich matter. Uh, at the moment, we don't even know what the composition of the core of a neutron star is. Uh, and one way to get at that kind of physics is to uh, look at the macroscopic properties of neutron star, their radii and masses allowed uh, in, in the universe. Uh, and uh, we can do that among other things through the observations of compact binary mergers, but also through the observations of uh, X-ray emission from neutron stars, such as uh, as done by NISA, for example. Uh, and then uh, the, the third kind of uh, topic that I'm going to touch uh, on a lot more in this talk is the production of heavy elements. Uh, we will see that neutron star merger eject a lot of neutron rich matter in which uh, we can get our process of rapid neutron capture nuclear synthesis, which is the process for which about half of the elements heavier than iron are produced in the universe. Uh, and we would like to figure out whether neutron star mergers are the main or one of the main uh, source of opposite elements or whether we need to rely nearly entirely on something else. And that's going to come from a combination of uh, modeling how much our process elements are produced in any given merger and actually observing the event rates of these mergers through gravitational waves largely. And once we have those two things, we can actually get an idea of uh, whether heavy elements come mostly from neutron star mergers or whether we need something else the main alternative generally discussed being core collapse supernovae uh, and particularly ra rare types of core collapse supernovae. Um, and then beyond that, there are some um, you know, other interesting, uh, a lot of other interesting things that we can do with neutron star mergers. I, I listed a few here. Uh, we do uh, need uh, to understand neutron star mergers better if we want to understand the process 
uh, by which short gamma i bursts are produced, assuming that they are actually produced in uh, neutron star mergers, but we know at least of one. So that's, uh, uh, and we assume that a large number at least of them are produced in neutron star mergers. But we don't really know uh, how to go from the merger itself and the pre merger magnetic field specifically to uh, the production of a relativistic jet uh, and which systems can produce a relativistic jet. And we can do some cosmology with neutron star mergers, for example, measurements of the Hubble constant. And a lot of information about uh, you know, the population of compact objects, uh, which is uh, interesting uh, to constrain uh, both stellar evolution and uh, binary compact binary evolution. And there are, there are a lot of process, uh, you know, here in stellar evolution, binary evolution that are not very well understood right now, uh, and that uh, do, do impact the population of merging binaries. So that's one way to get at this. Here I mostly focus on the nuclear physics, but the others are of course also interesting to look into. All right. Now, uh, to get a, you an idea of what well, some of the systems look like, at least in our numerical simulations, uh, let me show you these simulations by uh, Sasha Chanoglazov. Uh, this is a slice through the equatorial plane of a binary neutron star merger right at the time at which they are colliding. Uh, so here you have the density on the log scale, the two colliding neutron stars. And here, uh, what we are going to show is the uh, magnetic energy density uh, also on the log scale. Uh, and this is right at the two stars are, colli are colliding, and there is a very strong shear between the two merging neutron stars because each of these core is moving at maybe 30 to 40 percent of the speed of light in opposite direction. So there is very strong shear in the intermediate region. And uh, there are a few interesting things that, that are happening in these mergers. One is the formation of tidal tails from which matter, matter is going to be ejected. And then at the same time, there is all of these instabilities here. This is the Kelvin Helmholtz instability in the shear region. She's going to uh, rapidly grow the magnetic field in these intermediate regions on at least relatively small scales. And then as the two core collide, there is more and more, there is more ejection of matter, which in this case comes from the, uh, you know, the, the collision and then bounce of the core as they uh, interact with each other. Basically, um, this is the millisecond, millisecond, sorry, oh, millisecond. Uh, so yeah, the typical time scale for the collision itself is about one millisecond, uh, and then uh, roughly speaking, yeah, um, mainly depending how you define it, but of the order of milliseconds uh, for, for the collision, right? And so uh, you have the formation in many of these systems of an accretion disk around a compact object. It could be a black hole, it could be a neutron star, and then ejection of matter uh, again, both through tidal tails and through the collision of the two cores, and then later on, as we we'll see, through winds from the disk. The, thing, uh, the other thing to note here, which is important from a numerical simulation point of view, but is actually unphysical, is that you can notice that uh, the magnetic energy rapidly decays here and the magnetic field here decays as well. And that is not what we expect to happen physically. This is uh, an unfortunate feature of our simulations that we do not have sufficient resolution to stop the decay of that magnetic field through reconnection, uh, the, the small scale magnetic field reconnecting and uh, eventually dissipating in the system. If we wanted to actually maintain that magnetic field and maybe get a gamma ray burst afterwards, we would need much higher resolution here. We don't, so we see this decay here, but that's not, that's not physical. That's just numerical error. Right? And the reason I'm showing you to that is that this is one of the very important limitations of current simulations, is that mo uh, basically no simulation is capable of having high enough resolution to self-consistently grow the magnetic field from realistic initial conditions to what happens post-merger and then maintain that magnetic field and grow a large scale structure magnetic field, which we assume probably must exist because we see short gamma bursts and they are probably formed in uh, large scale magnetic fields, uh, but we cannot actually get that in the simulations. So, so can you tell us a little bit more about the simulations or are you going to do that later? Uh, I wasn't planning specifically to get into the details. So what do you want to know? <laughs> Yeah, there's 3D MHD. This is 3D MHD. Uh, yeah. So in this this one is just a 3D uh, generativistic magnetic hydrodynamics. Uh, well, just totally uh, complicated uh, with uh, without neutrino transport. I believe in this case. Uh, this was this was done specifically to look at uh, the behavior of magnetic fields in fact. Static or isothermal or. No, no this is a nuclear uh, kind of nuclear theory based. I mean, they're all people don't like when I say that. Uh, so this is. Uh, I believe the DD2 equation of state, which is kind of a table of equation of state of, of, of pressure and uh, internal energy as a function of density, temperature, composition, uh, which is based on a, on a specific nuclear physics model. Uh, so uh, this, this one. No. 
Or are you doing radiation? In this one, there is no cooling, but in most of our simulations, there is, yeah. In this one, there is no cooling specifically, yeah. Uh, but in, in some simulations that I show you, um, do I have one with cooling that is actually a movie? I don't know. So some of the results I show you definitely have cooling. cooling. And I, I need, whenever you introduce neutrino transport, you actually have cooling, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, but the other thing is it's a, a grid-based code? Yes. So how does this um, compare? In terms of resolution, there's a new simulation out by Combi and Siegel, I believe. Um, they did, I don't. The Daniel Siegel simulation is probably high resolution. I mean, this this is relatively low resolution. This is 100, 150 meter grid spacing. They, they, they go an order of magnitude better than that, which is you know extremely expensive. Uh, I don't know about the Siegel one, but I know the that um, the Kyushi simulations, for example, and some simulations by. Uh, uh, Steve Libling as well, going more like the 10, 10, 20 meter resolution. This most recent work, I don't think was seeing a decay in the magnetic energy. No, you don't necessarily see a decay. Uh, what you, uh, what you do not, what I, as far as I have, I have seen you, uh, I hasn't been seen is the growth of a large scale magnetic field from initial conditions where the strength of the magnetic field was not already large. Right. That, 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 but so you, you can have simulations that actually do not show that decay. Uh, uh, but there is one. There is not really a convergence to the final to a final solution that is you know, reliably captured. I think they started from quite a large. Solution. Yeah, exactly. And, and so if you, if you calculate, uh, so I, I would have to look at the Seeger specifically. Uh, um, I do not remember off the top of my head. Uh, oh, dynamo theory that the field. There's yeah. the temporary growth and the asymptotic resistance. Yeah. So, yeah. Not unphysical necessarily. Yeah, so I mean, the the thing at some point we would expect some. I mean, if, if we want to form those those jets, right? We would expect some sort of a dynamo leading. Uh, you know, you start from ten to the nine Gauss. Let's say, well, right? Yeah, the jet. So you need. Oh, you would want to start with a magnetar only yeah. for jets. Maybe. We, you would need enough mergers with the magnetar, I guess, for that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's possible. I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe the because we we cannot actually show. Uh, a jet from you know, 10 to the 9 to the 10 Gauss, uh, that the, the simulations cannot capture that. We have to start yeah, from 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16. Uh, and there we know we can form them, sure. <laughs> I think, the, yeah. You do get amplifications, yeah. You get amplifications. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you do get amplification, I mean, up to 10 to the 16 Gauss, roughly in those uh, in the small features earlier, yeah. yeah. Even if you start with uh, with lower than that. Uh, the question to me is whether, uh, if you start from a low field and you only grow those small scale instabilities, how do you go to the large scale field? Or do you even go to the large scale field? I think it's more of a good question. And I think that question we have not answered. And that, that's the one that requires very high resolution. Now, this is lower resolution than the best MHD simulations. Okay? Actually, all code is definitely not the best code at doing MHD. Uh, we, have more, we have more focus on neutrino transport. Uh, this, uh, there are people who have run with an order of magnitude better resolution than that. Uh, but, um, Actually, actually showing convergence of the result is not something that people have done yet, uh, and that will be extremely expensive. Anything else while I'm on this? Okay. Uh, all right. This picture uh, many people are probably familiar with. Uh, it's by, by Rodrigo Fernandez and Brian Mezger in their review from 2016. But just to get an idea of the overall evolution in time scales, uh, in a binary merger, first we have gravitational wave emission uh, that you know leads to the inspire of the uh, binary as it loses energy and angular momentum uh, that can last for as long as you want. Some of them will never merge over the Hubble time scale, but we only really see the last few, uh, you know, seconds to in the near future, hopefully minutes of the evolution of, of these things uh, with uh, detectors such as LIGO and Virgo and CAGRA. Uh, at that point, you know, all the macrophysics is kind of irrelevant, uh, except maybe if you're trying to explain uh, Fast radio bursts through uh, you know, magnetic field interactions, and then obviously magnetic field are, are important. But from the point of view of gravitational wave emission and post-merger evolution, uh, you know this is just GR plus fluid. Uh, then you have the collision of the two objects, which we have just seen: uh, ejection of material in tidal phase and through the collision of the two cores. And that's the time scale of roughly milliseconds uh, that, that we are concerned about here. And then we form a black hole or a neutron star surrounded by an accretion disk. This specific picture shows the jet only on the black hole. I am not convinced that it cannot be one on the neutron star either. So, you know, this is not necessarily the only two options. Um, and uh, that accretion disk is itself going to continue accreting, of course, onto the compact object, but also continuously eject matter into the surrounding interstellar medium over a much longer time scale. 
roughly two uh, broad kind of time scales over about a fraction of a second, maybe 0.1 second. You have magnetically driven winds, which are very strongly uh, impacted by the large scale structure of the magnetic field post merger, which we don't know. So that one is hard to model. And then over a second time scale, there is viscous expansion of the accretion disk, which is also actually due to magnetic field. It's the magnetorotational instability. Uh, but that one actually we can we understand better. And we know that over a few seconds, you know, somewhere between five to 20% of the disk is going to be unbound through uh, you know, viscous angular momentum transport effectively. Uh, so uh, a bunch of different ways to eject matter during, during these mergers. Uh, and so this is kind of the part where numerical simulations are important is from these millisecond time scale of the merger to seconds after the merger when the disk is evolving, uh, at least general optimistic simulations. Uh, then the matter is, is you know, expanding into the surrounding interstellar medium, and that's why it undergoes rapid neutron capture nuclear synthesis. So you have some seed nuclei in that neutron rich ejector, and they are going to rapidly capture neutrons forming heavier and heavier nuclei, occasionally uh, experiencing a beta decay. But uh, that whole process happens very, very far into the neutron rich uh, you know, region of parameter space, much more neutron rich than stable elements, because these, uh, in, in these conditions, if you are close to stable elements, neutron capture is much, much, much faster than beta decay. So you capture a lot of neutrons, and then you go very close actually to the neutron drip line, uh, uh, building heavier and heavier nuclei. And at some point, you run out of neutrons, and then that process stops, and those uh, heavy nuclei decay back towards stable elements. Um, so the, the R process itself, you know, the production of those very neutron rich elements lasts maybe a second. And then they are going to radioactive, radioactivity decay over all kinds of time scale, of course, depending on the lifetime of the elements. Uh, initially, most of that, uh, the energy released by the R process is dumped into the ejecta or lost to neutrinos. But at some point, maybe a day, maybe a week after the merger, the ejecta becomes optically thin to uh, optical and infrared photons. And then we actually see that radioactive cloud as a kilonova. So this is basically what a, what a kilonova is. It's, uh, you know, emission from radio from the, uh, due to the heating radioactive heating of the matter ejected by by the merger right. uh, and overall you know the kind of the three main components that we have observed so far in terms of you know, counterpart to a merger you know, this, this gravitational wave signal the gamma ray burst and uh, the kilonova coming afterwards uh, of course uh, the gamma ray burst and every uh, afterglow of the gamma ray burst in all frequencies uh, and in theory there is also a possibility of a radio emission on months to years to decades time scale after the merger as the uh, ejecta decelerates through the interstellar medium. Uh, but that is very hard to see, especially for mergers happening in relatively low density environments, which according to bias is seen for short gamma but so far might be the majority of the mergers. Uh, so, and then the radio transient can happen on decades time scale and be nearly invisible to us very dim. Uh, but people are still looking for it. Um, all right. Uh, now, the, uh, the first um, no, reason that uh, neutrino transport is important specifically in these systems, or beyond cooling, is uh, in the outcome of nucleosynthesis. And so if, what I'm showing you here is the abundances of various elements as a function of mass number uh, in a nuclear reaction network run by Jonas Lipuner and Luke Roberts. Uh, and the parameter that we use to um, you know, kind of parameterize the uh, composition of the matter in neutron star mergers is typically the electron fraction, which is the fraction of either electrons or protons uh, to the total number of nucleons, neutrons, and protons. You can also see it as the proton fraction effectively. Uh, and in a neutron star, this is, a, this is less than 10%. It's very neutron rich. Uh, and if you don't actually change the electron fraction somehow, uh, you end up with a uh, result of the R process, which is something like the black or yellow curve here, where you form a lot of elements above mass number of 120 or so, and very little of the ones around here. Uh, and for comparison, the red dots here show you the inferred abundances of R process elements in the solar system. And you can see that indeed these uh, you know, neutron rich outflows can reasonably produce everything here. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of nuclear physics facilities here, so don't trust any specific point, but the overall features are right. Uh, and then they underproduce things here. The way to get to this in neutron star merger is to somehow raise your number of protons. And the way to raise your number of protons 
is by emission and absorption of electron types, neutrinos and antineutrinos. Right? And so this is why we actually need neutrinos if we, uh, or at least why neutrinos are important is in changing that electron fraction of the others. Uh, if you want to explain all of our process nucleosynthesis through uh, neutron star mergers, you need both neutron rich outflows and something like the blue outflows, which are less neutron rich, maybe a quarter or more uh, protons. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to uh, explain all of the R process through mergers. There's no guarantee that's the case. But if you want, you need both of them. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the other important uh, impact of the of the you know, these neutrinos uh, changing the composition of the outflows is that uh, lanthanides around here and actinides around here are very high opacity elements, and if you have them present, uh, that is going to change the electromagnetic counterpart to the uh, to the system. Yeah. Uh, basically, if your opacity if your opacity is higher in the outflows, it's going to uh, take longer for the outflows to become optically thin. Uh, and so you are going to have a dimmer and longer lived kilonova. You go from something like the black curve, if you have a neutron rich, sorry, neutron poor outflow, to the red curve, if you have a neutron rich outflow. And it, because those uh, opacities are mainly important in the uh, optical and the infrared band, you also change the color of the emission from something that is optical to something that is infrared for the very neutron rich. But the, the fact that there are those differences is very useful to us because it means that if we observe a kilonova, we can actually get information about the outflows and about what kind of nucleosynthesis was happening. So it's, it's good in many ways that there are those differences because it means that features in the EM observations can actually tell us about what was happening in the merger. Right? Otherwise, we would be unable to extract much from, from a kilonova observation, except for the fact that there was some R process nucleosynthesis. Uh, and for what it's worth, in the one event that we have seen, we do tend to see a composition of both neutron rich and less neutron rich uh, matter, at least uh, in the best fits that we have seen so far. But you know, from one event, it's hard to generalize too much. So we'll see what happens in the future. Okay. All right. Uh, so from that, we can guess what we actually need in simulations. And I'm, uh, I'm going to briefly summarize that here. Uh, during, you know, before the two objects collide, we need general relativity, uh, full nonlinear general relativity, uh, and we need, of course, a prescription for the dense matter in the neutron star, pressure, uh, internal energy as a function of density, temperature, and so on. Uh, and we need relativistic hydrodynamics to evolve the uh, neutron star fluid, even if it's maybe not entirely a fluid. Uh, and that's basically it if you want to model gravitational waves before merger. But then after that, we have all of that extra physics. So we have seen magnetic fields, which requires very high resolution if you want to do it properly. And uh, there is neutrino transport, which is important for all of those, you know, uh, kilonovi and uh, nuclear synthesis outputs. Uh, and we will see that, that the problem here is the high dimensionality of the problem. Uh, right. And we have to do that over many different timescales. Uh, just the merger itself, a uh, you know, typical time step for the code is nanoseconds. The evolution of the disk happens on seconds time scale. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty wide range of time scale to bridge with numerical simulations. So at this point, to be honest, are, while all of that physics is too complex for direct analytical treatments, there is also no simulations that can really do all of that to the accuracy that we would like, right? Uh, we do approximations uh, to uh, at least some of these, uh, of these processes, right? That's kind of where, where we are. Um, any questions on the first part? So I move to the matter outflows, what we know about them. Anything online? No? Okay. All right. Uh, matter outflows. So if we want to understand kilonovi and if we want uh, and use them to actually infer information about the merging objects, and if we want to understand our process nucleosynthesis from mergers, we need to understand the matter ejected by these mergers. That's kind of the, the, the core part here. Uh, and uh, we, we have a pretty you know, kind of the, the broad message here that I'm going to try to convey is that we have a good uh, qualitative idea of what happens in these mergers and how different types of outflows depend on different parameters of the binary. But with some minor exceptions in the case of black hole neutron star mergers, we have very poor quantitative models for these things at the moment, and we need to actually improve them significantly if we want to get to the point where we can extract information directly from kilonova observations. So here are three, three of the main types of uh, outcome that we can expect and different types of outflows. 
Uh, the four types that is not shown here is the black hole neutron star merger where the neutron star does not disrupt. It would be entire black. There is nothing. The neutron star falls into the black hole. Uh, there is no outflows. It's not extremely interesting. Uh, but there is uh, this black hole neutron star case here where the neutron star is ripped apart by the black hole. In that case, you expect a fair amount of mass, a few percent of the solar mass, to be ejected in a cold uh, tidal tail. And because that matter is cold, it is not going to interact much with neutrinos. Neutrino matter interactions are very sensitive to temperature. Uh, and that means that this is going to remain very neutron rich and thus lead to an infrared dim kilonova. Uh, so that's, that's one component. And that one is pretty well modeled. We have good predictions for the amount of mass ejected as a function of the binary parameter. Then you form an accretion disk around the black hole. And as we mentioned before, that accretion disk is going to continuously eject matter somewhere between five to overall 40% of the mass of the disk, depending on how compact the disk was initially and uh, how much magnetic fields you, how much large scale magnetic field you had in your disk. Uh, and there, you know, there are some of these, in the case of black hole neutron star merger, maybe we have five factor of two uh, for how much mass is going to be ejected uh, as a function of the initial parameters. Uh, and there is a bit more uncertainty on uh, the actual composition of these outflows because the longer these simulations that have been performed so far have not been, perf been performed with advanced neutrino transport. And so we don't really know what kind of composition we end up with there um, in, in the uh, long-term evolution of these disks. Uh, but we know that they are going to be, you know, much uh, slower than the dynamical ejector. And um, well, the, the amount of mass uh, is in, in background from some merger is typically of the same order or maybe even sometimes smaller than, a, than the, than the tidal ejector, except for very low mass system. Right. Uh, what we know is that you know, if you have a large neutron star, it's easier to disrupt it. So that means more outflow. If you have a low mass black hole, you have a better chance of disrupting the neutron star, more outflows. If you have rapidly spinning black holes, also more outflows. That's, those are kind of the important parameters here. If you have two neutron stars, instead of a neutron star and a black hole, well, you still have potential disruption of one neutron star by the other, especially if you have an asymmetric system. So if one neutron star is much, small, uh, much lighter than the other, it is likely to be tidally disrupted by its companion. And then you get again tidal ejecta, which is called a neutron rich and so on. Same as for black hole neutron star system, basically, uh, except that you had have, you have a, have a compact massive neutron star into the black hole for the companion. Uh, and if you have the same, the same dependencies on the binary parameters as in this case. Uh, then on top of that, you have the, the ejecta, which is here called squeeze in this image by Dan Kaysen and collaborators, which is, which is what uh, the ejecta that comes from the collision and bounce of the cores of the two neutron star. And because it comes from you know, that kind of shocked region, it's much hotter. And if, it's, if it is much hotter, it emits and absorbs a lot more neutrinos. So that is the ejecta that is most likely to shoot to higher electron fraction and give you, uh, you know, uh, an optical kilonova something that uh, produced the lower mass element. And we have some so, kind of the same kind of uh, velocities as uh, the, the, the dynamic ejecta as well. Uh, now they, they, interestingly, uh, at least when, for when we can build models, this ejecta has a very different dependence on the parameters of the system as this one. This one requires one neutron star to be disrupted by the other. This one on the other hand requires neutron star to hit each other really hard. Uh, that means that it's good to have actually compact neutron star that hit each other at high velocity. Well, in this case, you actually want one neutron star to be relatively puffy and easy to disrupt. So there, there, there are different system and different equations of state will lead to different ratios of these two uh, outputs. Uh, and then on top of that, you again form either a black hole or a neutron star surrounded by an accretion disk. Same thing as for the uh, black hole neutron star system, except that if your central object is a neutron star, it is hot and emitting a lot of neutrinos. And so that central neutron star is going to irradiate all of the matter around it with neutrinos. And that is going to lead quite likely to a higher electron fraction, more neutrino matter interactions in the outflows in the presence of a neutron star. Uh, on top of that, there might be a lot of interesting observational counterparts to having a you know, rapidly spinning, highly magnetized neutron star surrounded by an accretion disk, uh, which might also be uh, visible, of course. And I'll help you figure out whether you actually have a neutron star there. Uh, but you know, the one we have seen so far has no uh, sign of a long lived neutron star remnant, at least. Any question on this? Um, hmm, do I, um, on what? The electron fraction, where it comes from. 
Uh, yeah, we'll talk a bit about that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I have said that uh, we have good you know, qualitative understanding. I, I can tell you how the parameters changing, changes the different mass of all flows. But now here is what uh, the current state of quantitative predictions are. This is a plot uh, by Amelia Henkel, who is a graduate student at UNH, and she took uh, four different models for the mass of the disk after a neutron star neutron star merger. This is for the same chirp mass as the first neutron star neutron star merger because that's always what we use first. Uh, it's the one system that we know best. And this is a function of mass ratio here and size of the neutron star on the uh, x axis. Uh, exactly which, uh, you know, which model is which does not really matter too much. The important thing is that. While well, you can, if you screen, see some broad agreement on how things depend on the parameters, at least in the part that we understand, which is kind of the top uh, relatively asymmetric part, there's definitely a very significant difference in the quantitative predictions of the outflows. Right? Everyone agrees that if you add symmetric mass ratio and compact stars, you don't produce much of a disk, sure. Everyone agrees that if you get to higher mass ratio and higher radii, you produce more of a disk, yes. But apart from that, you can have you know, orders of magnitude disagreement in the predictions of these models. That means that if you are trying to use these models to infer the parameter of the system from a kilonova, you are going to get it wrong. It's guaranteed. Uh, you know, uh, my current recommendation would be to you know, look at predictions from different models and make sure that uh, you kind of take that as a broad estimate of the uh, current uncertainties in, in modeling. You know? Uh, but we definitely need to do better with you know just more parameter space coverage over these especially higher mass ratio system um, so that's kind of uh, where we are in terms of you know, quantitative modeling which is not great for neutron star neutron star measure okay for black neutron star things are better okay um let me skip this and uh for black neutron star merger um as we mentioned before there are basically basically two types of systems there's the one where the neutron star does not disrupt and falls into the black hole, and the ones where the neutron star disrupts and uh, you, know, you form an accretion disk and the ejection of matter. Uh, in some way, this is one of the best understood uh, distinction in these systems at, at this point. Uh, and that, in theory, can help you make cuts through parameter space if you were to see an electromagnetic counterpart to a black hole neutron star system. This is kind of what I'm showing you here, except that in these two systems, there was no electromagnetic counterpart. These are the two first black hole neutron star systems seen by LIGO. Uh, the exact names don't matter too much. Uh, and the red region shows you the parameter inference from LIGO uh, of me replotting the samples that were made public by the LIGO Vogel collaboration uh, as a function of black hole spin aligned with the angular momentum and black hole mass. And for any, uh, if you know the black hole mass, because the chirp mass is pretty well uh, constrained, you actually also know the neutron star mass. Uh, it's just not plotted here, but the two are degenerate. Um, and once you have that, you can make a cut through the parameter space and say, okay, what is the minimum radius that an initial star would have to have in order to disrupt, to be disrupted by his black hole companion? And uh, if you take the peak of the distribution here and here, you see that you would need a roughly 14 and a half kilometer neutron star, 14 and a half kilometer neutron star to actually get tidal disruption. This is very high uh, radius by the standard of current constraints on neutron star radii. Uh, but you can see that we're actually not very far from actually having you know, meaningful constraints from tidal disruption. In that, you know, here we actually, actually do extend to things like close to 13 kilometer, which is kind of at the high end of the predictions for neutron star radii these days. Uh, this one was a little bit worse. Uh, you extend to maybe 13 and a half, 13.8 kilometer or so. Now, if you know, we had a system like that, but let's say with a spin of 0.2 higher than we were here instead, right? Then if we see an electromagnetic counterpart, we would actually be able to make a straight cut through parameters, through the parameter space of these systems, uh, saying that, okay, well, first, only the samples in the disrupting regions are possible. And second, the, the radius of the neutron star has to be in that range here. But to be clear, you don't want to use disrupt in these two events. In these two events, we have not seen an EM counterpart. Of course, not seeing an EM counterpart is not a proof that there is no EM counterpart, uh, because in this case, the, uh, you know, the sky, the uncertainty on the scale of realization was also pretty, uh, pretty wide. Uh, this is more illustrative for the type of system that we have actually already seen, because those are the systems with, for which I have actually parameters to show, right? Of how far, how, how close we are from actually tidal disruption. But it, 
if I if I had a black hole control system, I would rather I, you know, it, it's better if you do see parallel disruption because if you do see an EM counterpart, you know that there is an EM counterpart. <laughs> if you don't see an EM counterpart, you are not quite sure. So I'd, I would rather have, a, have the capture parameter space coming from actually having an EM counterpart. Now, for, for these two systems, it would actually have been extremely surprising if we had seen one, right? Uh, considering considering this, it would have been actually uh, yeah a, a little bit of attention with some some other uh, constraints on neutron star radii if we had seen an EM counterpart from either of those. So why can't you detect the disruption before ISCO in the gravitational wave data? Uh, you in theory you can, but uh, the disruption occurs at like one to two kilohertz, and LIGO is not extremely sensitive in that range. Uh, so at, at this point, I don't think that LIGO is capable of differentiating between a disrupting and non-disrupting system from the uh, data itself. It's a lot harder to see tidal effects and disruption in BHNF than it is to see uh, tidal effects in the kind of low mass neutron star system like 17 or 817. Uh, but in theory, it is possible, yes, to see the disruption through gravitational waves. You would just need a large enough signal with good sensitivity at one or two kilohertz. Uh, it's not the most likely thing to happen in the you know kind of next few rounds or so who knows we could be at lucky uh but that would certainly be one way to get at it yes does that answer your question yes thank you okay anything else all right <clears throat> um so to include this part again uh, we have a decent qualitative understanding of the outflows uh but uh, quantitative modeling for nsns systems is uh problematic uh, for BHNS, we have actually models that can predict the amount of mass ejected to, you know, for the data ejecta to 10 to 20 percent. Uh, and then for the post merger outflows, modeling the mass uh, of the outflows from the total mass of the disk is possible to within the factor of two, which for black hole neutron star merger again gives us reasonably good prediction within that factor of two. Uh, but there are a lot of uncertainties on the properties of the outflows due to neutral transport. And I, I'll get back to that later uh, in this talk. Mm -hmm. You want very much to know the properties of the outflow, less the electron fraction in this case, more just the total, yeah. the fuller region. Yeah, so yeah, for, for GRBs, yeah. It sounds like it's not under control. Yet. No, no that, that part is not. No, no sorry. I, when I, when I, what I talk here is the outflow that powers the kilometer. Sure. The, 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 the yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the uh, ultra relativistic outflows uh, in the jet, those are not under control at all. Well, well, <laughs> or trans relativistic outflow that occurs probably before you get to the very relativistic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that, yeah, that is also not because I mean, the, the two paths are the you know, driven wind and the magneto rotational outflows, and which of those is more important in the yeah. polar region, I assume, is still open uh yeah well i think the, so the neutrino driven wind is actually very weak it's hard to eject more than maybe you know 10 to the minus four solar masses so through neutrino driven wind in in, uh, in in a black hole plus this system in the neutron star plus this system there might be a bit more but not a huge amount uh generally simulations which actually have a you know meaningful magnetic field tend to have more magnetic you know not necessarily mri but uh, it, the, the mri is not enough to generate a, a very large amount of Early magnetically driven outflows, but if you have a large scale field structure, then yes, you can get a much larger outflows from the magnetically driven outflows. If you have just neutrinos, typically neutrino driven outflow is going to be very very small amount of mass compared to either the viscous outflows at late time or the or the dynamic ejecta at early times uh, in in current simulations. Uh, now neutrinos could matter a fair amount in you know uh, clearing up the polar regions of matter. Uh, through pair annihilation, and that's not under control. Uh, and then, of course, the, all of those uh, relativistic, uh, all of those polar outflows depend a lot on the magnetic field structure, which is not under control. So, all of that is not under control. Yeah. That's right. Because the uh, field assumes you have the, especially the charge current absorption in the polar regions under control. Yes, I thing that we do the charge current that uh, the charge, charge current we do it's the pairs that it's the pair processes that are not well constrained at this point the charge current i think we have decent uh, decent handle the charge current is what's largely driving that could be uh yeah so that's most of the absorption yeah so so it, well, so the neutron driven wind from the outskirts of the disk and from the surface of the neutron star that that's we have the the physics to capture in all simulations with neutrino transport 
uh, but it's a small amount of matter. Uh, then the what happens in the polar regions that is more that is more like pair annihilation, and that is not captured by the sim very well by the simulations. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right, neutrinos. Speaking <laughs> uh, for the last uh, I don't know. <laughs> 10, 15, uh, we see. 10, all right. Uh, so as we, we already mentioned a fair amount of that, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of, of time here, but the main role of neutrinos is to cool the remnants because photons can't do that, they are trapped. Uh, it's uh, neutrino emission from the neutron star, from the hot neutron star and from the disk is the main source of cooling in these systems. They can heat out frozen and drive neutrino driven winds, also it is not a huge amount of matter as we just discussed. And most importantly, maybe in terms of uh, you know, nuclear synthesis and kilonovi, the drive changes in the composition of the matter. And I'll show you some example in a minute. Uh, and then there is, uh, as we said, the position of energy in the polar regions through pair annihilation. So they are certainly very important to kilonovi and R process nuclear synthesis, and maybe GRBs. That, that part is, le is less certain, short GRBs. All right, so uh, what is the problem in properly including neutrinos in simulations? Well, we want to solve Boltzmann's equation for the distribution function of neutrino because neutrinos are not in equilibrium with the fluid. So we actually have to evolve the distribution function as a function of position, but also momentum of the neutrinos. So that is a six plus one dimensional problem, evolution of a six dimensional function in time. Uh, we neglect the, the mass of the neutrinos here. Uh, and so we assume that the neutrino for momentum is, is a null, null vector. And uh, we evolve such a function for uh, each species of neutrinos and each species of anti neutrinos. So that's in theory six such functions to evolve. That is already a high dimensional problem. On top of that, there, is very, uh, there can be couplings between very different parts of the parameter space of that function. Uh, there, are, uh, there is important scattering effects which couple different momenta. There is uh, pair annihilations which couple neutrinos to anti neutrinos. There is oscillations, which couple neutrinos of different flavors, uh, meaning that all of these distribution functions are coupled to each other in their evolution, uh, sometimes relatively stiffly. Uh, and on top of that, there is very stiff coupling, so very large source terms in uh, the coupling between neutrinos and the fluid, a very strong coupling of the neutrino to the temperature and composition, at least in the denser regions of your system. Uh, so, so strong of a coupling in fact that you definitely need to have some sort of implicit method in your evolution of the neutrinos uh, if you want to avoid numerical instabilities in your evolutions, right? Uh, otherwise, uh, you take one time step and your temperature and composition has changed so much uh, that uh, the properties of your neutrinos should have completely you know, changed uh, over, over, over the time step. But if you, have, if you have not consistently followed the evolution of the fluid and the evolution of the neutrinos, uh, you are going to actually have divergence of the uh, of the of the evolution in your code. Current strategies: while well, most uh, simulations use some sort of approximate treatment of the neutrinos, uh, either uh, the two that I'm going to talk about here are leakage and uh, moment schemes, and then uh, a few simulations now have moved towards full transport, uh, mostly through Monte Carlo methods, uh, and uh, I'll probably touch on that at the end of the talk, but we can talk about it a lot more tomorrow as well. Uh, and a lot, a lot of these methods, by the way, are borrowed either from the supernova community, where neutrinos are much more important to even the dynamics of the system, or from the accretion disk uh, community, uh, where it was mostly done for photon transport, but you can take a lot of these methods and actually use them for neutrino transport as well. Okay. So let's start with the easiest and the one that people you know, have, have used the most, probably is the leakage scheme. The general idea here is that, you know, you have your system here. Let's say that this is a region of dense matter. This is a region of no, very little matter. If you are here, you can easily calculate the emission of neutrino by just calculating the emissivity, assuming that neutrinos are free streaming. That's something that you can tabulate as a function of density, temperature, composition, uh, given a certain nuclear physics model. And so you can actually get this value relatively accurately. Uh, in the leakage scheme, you just immediately remove the energy and possibly change the lepton number according to the emission. In the dense region here, instead, you are going to assume that the neutrinos reach some sort of equilibrium energy density, equilibrium with the fluid, and you can create a diffusion time scale to the boundary of your system, which depends on the opacity of uh, your uh, object here, you know, the, the optical depth between this point and this point. And uh, the relationship between that optical depth and the diffusion time scale is something that is calibrated to uh, transport simulations. 
And you estimate that the energy loss is that uh, equilibrium energy density divided by the diffusion time scale, roughly speaking. Uh, and in that, with that, in that way, uh, and, well, and in between, in the regions where the optical depth is of order one, you make some interpolation between the two, best you can do. Uh, people have been able to, in that way to get the. Yeah, sorry. So you're saying it's calibration. Yeah, so. Uh, so given that you do the calibration with. Given that you do the calibration. <laughs> given that you do the calibration, and nobody can hear me, uh, the people in the room, um, you must have some estimate of the mismatch between the true results and the summation it works uh neutral sum mergers are not symmetric <laughs> uh and so uh, the, the best way we have to is to just compare our results with high with better transport uh, methods uh because a lot of the, the calibrations were done for more like strictly symmetric systems but we can compare results to more advanced transport methods and there's at least factor of two or three uh, errors in the luminosity. So it's order of magnitude accurate, but it's not very, it's not accurate at a few percent, uh, or even 10 percent. So it's factor of a few, factor of a few errors in the luminosity of neutrinos. So that's, that's one issue with this. So uh, on the other hand, the disk tends to be self regulated, uh, meaning it emits neutrinos and then it kind of collapses into itself uh, and uh, it reheats and it can kind of get to a kind of it kind of is at the same temperature regardless of how much neutrinos you emit and it just gets a little bit more compact or less compact depending on how much neutrinos you you emit so there's kind of a self-regulating system here that leads the system the, the disk in roughly the same temperature electron fraction uh, anyway uh if you're just include cooling uh and just more or less compact depending on how much neutrinos you have so you can get the thermodynamics of the system reasonably well with this uh but you know not not uh, not as well as with the full transport method uh the main weakness of this method is, uh, as written here, is that if I emit the neutrinos here and I have outflows here, the neutrinos emitted from here might irradiate the outflows here and be reabsorbed. And this is not uh, done in a scheme like this. There are ways to do it, but then it becomes a lot more expensive and geometry dependent. You have to make some assumption about the geometry to know where the neutrinos are going to go. And some, uh, so some codes have actually developed very complex ways to do that, uh, especially useful in uh, codes that are not grid based. Uh, where they, uh, they can actually uh, just use uh, they just they just use leakage and not transport on the grid based code. But but, but leakage uh, can can if you do a correction go over into what's effectively flux limited diffusion. How is that doing these days? Uh, so uh, especially in the post in the disk after motor, people have been using that, uh, and yeah, it, it gets it gets to be a complicated leakage scheme. With, 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 a lot, with a lot of calibration to specific geometries and uh, it's uh, um, and uh, calculate, I mean, basically you can, you, can, you can estimate where the neutrinos are going to go on the neutrino sphere and then from there integrate over the neutrino sphere and seeing how much neutrinos you are going to get there and kind of make a guess for how much neutrinos you are going to get at any given point and then absorb them. It's, it's possible, it gets, it gets more expensive, but it's possible, yeah. And people have done that in the, uh, not, especially in non-generativistic disk simulations, and they find you know better certainly better than a factor of few agreement there. It's, it's more like at, at a, you know tens of percent level of, uh, errors, I think, at that point. But then your, your scheme becomes much more complicated. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's possible certainly. Okay. Um, Right, uh, anything I missed there. Uh, yeah, so, so basically what you are missing in this simple method without the reabsorption is the evolution of the electron fraction in the outflows, which is important for Uh I'm going to skip. So what you get on the other hand from these simulations is a good idea of the typical luminosity of neutrinos in this system, which is, you know, 10 to the 52 to 10 to the 54 ergs per second and the time scale over which the system evolved, which is maybe a hundred milliseconds or so. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what we got from the leakage simulations. All right, moment schemes. Uh, the general idea here is that instead of evolving the distribution function, you are going to integrate over momentum space uh, and you put different weights on your integral. So you integrate the distribution function as a function of angular distribution and energy weighted by the energy, again, to get the energy density. If you weighted by the direction of propagation of the neutrino, you get the flux. 
you can do the same, you can do the integral of Boltzmann's equation specifically with the right weights, and you get equations of this form, roughly speaking, ignoring the GR part here. This is kind of the Newtonian part, where you have something that looks like the fluid equations actually for the energy and momentum of the of the system with some flux here, which depend on the pressure tensor of the neutrinos, which we don't know, uh, and uh, some source terms here, which include both neutrino matter interactions and curvature terms, right? That's a general idea, roughly speaking. Uh, the, and this is just for a two moment scheme. You can, you can do one moment scheme, you can do the you know, you can do three moment scheme, you can do anything you want. But this is the one that has so far been used in merger simulations. The difficulty is that first you need to actually make an estimate for this, the pressure tensor of the neutrinos, which you don't evolve. And in these schemes, at least, where you integrate over energy, you also need to make a closure for the energy spectrum of the neutrinos. This is particularly important for neutrino matter interactions because neutrino matter interactions are strongly dependent on the neutrino energy. Most of them scale like the neutrino energy square. That means that if you don't have that closure in energy correct, uh, you are not going to uh, get a very accurate estimate of the absorption of neutrinos. That's a big issue in, in, the, in this, in this uh, uh, setup. Uh, you could make an energy dependent M1 scheme, and it has been done, and actually uh, there, it has been no use for post-merger disk simulations, but then it becomes, a lot, imagine that I have 20, 20 energy groups, now I'm evolving 80 variables, and I'm doing implicit time settings. Implicit time setting over 80 variables means inverting an 80 by 80 matrix. It gets expensive very fast, right? And by that point, maybe you want to go to something, to something else if you cannot make some approximation to you know, make your time setting a little bit less problematic. Uh, so it works fine if you have a, an optically thin disk, for example, where you don't really need you know, implicit time setting in most places. But if you have a neutron star and you do need uh, uh, implicit time setting, it gets very expensive. Right? Um, Okay, so uh, what, what we actually uh, learned from the moment schemes is actually uh, getting a pretty good idea of the range of electron fraction that is possible in this system. So if you, if you don't do a moment scheme, typically the electron fraction of the outflow is going to be P somewhere between you know, 0.05 and 0.2, a very neutron rich. But as soon as you include the absorption from the moment scheme, you get a much broader electron fraction. This is results from the first simulation with the moment scheme, which was performed by uh, the um, Kyoto group uh, using the, the stack record, and immediately they found range of electron fraction going from you know, 0.08 to, uh, which I think was the minimum of the equation of state in this case, probably given the, the sharp decline here, to about 0.45. And if you uh, transform that into nuclear synthesis output, uh, you actually produce all of the elements suddenly. So the high YE stuff. So the high YE stuff straight to this plot here. Okay, this is what it looks like on the vertical slice of the merger. Uh, this is this is from you know moment scheme and Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, and uh, this is you know you see YE here. So the the, the high YE mostly comes from the polar also the things so that, that go here. You know there so so there 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 are two ways of getting I guess regulating YE. One is you got your neutrinos streaming through, they're very high intensity, and the YE regulates to the ratios of the new to the new bars. The other is you have some more local um uh, you know balance between the forward and reverse beta reaction than the electron ion gas. And I assume that's what's happening in the middle panel because it's you're getting this very high YE. Yeah. Uh, uh right near the poles. So you get a lot of absorption here, uh, and then sort of, uh, actually, in these in these mergers, there is a lot more electron anti neutrinos than electron neutrinos. So after that, actually, your equilibrium might be actually at a bit lower. Why? You just have uh, much higher flux of an anti neutrinos streaming through. That'll push you to low IE, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and, and it has to be more the local plant. Yeah. So there's a lot of local stuff happening here. Uh, uh, which is uh, very close to the neutron star surface where you see that the, the YE grows to pretty high value. And then after that, actually, yeah, if, if anything, farther away, it gets a bit lower. And that, that might, that's quite likely in part from anti-neutrino absorption because uh, um, there are more, and there are electron neutrinos coming from here, but there are actually more anti-neutrinos than electron neutrinos coming out of the system. Uh, yeah, that, that is definitely true. Yeah. Is the Monte Carlo less active? Uh, I do believe that in this case, except in the dense regions, it is more accurate. So the YE doesn't get as high. 
It doesn't get well. Okay. Yeah. So uh, depends. Uh, this is uh, two two different simulations uh, with. Uh, so this I wanted to show you the errors kind of in the Monte Carlo closures. This one is for the pressure when if you two if two beams come together in the Monte, in the M1 closure, sorry, the, the movement scheme closure, they collide and merge, which is definitely not physical. We don't like that. Okay, that's one reason to not like moments. Uh, the other one is this. This is the energy closure. Uh, and the, the, the green curve shows you two different versions of the polar R closure with two different estimates from the, for the energy closure. And the one that I was showing you on the plots comparing, comparing with Monte Carlo is this one here, which goes to very high Y. This one has a much lower Y. The Monte Carlo is kind of here in this plot. So it is within the range of things you can get with moment schemes. <laughs> <laughs> but so it's not to say that the moment scheme is always higher or lower, but it depends a lot on the choice you make for that energy closure. And so it's very uncertain, at least, is what, what, I, what I would say. Resonance and time. So it can make you know, a significant difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, certainly, uh, how much? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, that's, a, that's that's just putting in different. Physics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, same physics. Different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. 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 but you're but you're right. There, there's other sorts of uncertainties. Yes, and uh, people, especially, I mean, it's related especially to the neutral driven wind that you were mentioning earlier. People people have you know argued for uh, at some point that the neutral driven wind is higher y, and you can get to higher y that way. But the problem is that the neutral driven wind is very slow, and there's a lot of time for neutral matter interactions. But in the system with MHD. You would get faster energy driven outflows that interact less with the neutrinos. And there is no guarantee that those remain at, at, at high YE. So if you just do neutrinos without good magnetic fields, you find very high YE winds. But once you include the magnetic field, they might drop. And that's something that people are currently working on, is actually having both of them together. Uh, they would have less time to interact. Yeah, I don't know. We will see. We will see. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are out of time. Yes. Wrap up, and then we can have a broader discussion. Uh, maybe the only other thing I should say we can go to Monte Carlo. Uh, which effectively samples the distribution function of neutrinos with packets. Uh, Monte Carlo currently is the cheapest way to go to full transport. It's very good at doing high dimensional problems with low, uh, with kind of low co computational cost, but it also converges relatively slow uh, with uh, number of packets. And it has a lot of problems, computationally speaking, in the dense regions where you have a lot of interactions. And I'm happy to talk about that more tomorrow. Uh, it's exactly what we need to do to actually do Monte Carlo in those dense regions. Uh, and I, we can probably stop stop here uh, and just uh, <laughs> I'm happy to talk, to talk more with anyone uh, who has questions. Great. Thank you very much, Francois. So if anyone has to dash off, feel free, but uh, we can take a couple of questions maybe just for a few more minutes. Let me check. Are there any questions online? Yeah, I have a question. Okay, Aaron, go ahead. So this is a question about... Um, I guess the the fastest ejecta and whether you're able to resolve this um, mm -hmm. you know very fast squeeze ejecta that comes from the, maybe the the contact right. interface. Right. No, that's a uh, that's a good point. Uh, so the very fastest ejecta. I mean, when people talk about the very fast ejecta that might be uh, so fast that you get UV emission from neutron decay, uh, that one uh, is. Very debatable. It's very debatable whether it's resolving simulations or not. When you get to 0 0.7, 0 0.8 C or something like that, because it's a very small amount of matter, uh, and I, I'm not convinced that that one is entirely resolving simulations. Um, the but the squeeze ejecta covers a much. I mean, most of it it covers a much broader range of uh, velocities from you know uh, maybe 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 C, 0.4 C, and that one is reasonably well resolved in the in the simulations. Uh, if you ignore my big field effects, which might impact things. Uh, in a hydro simulation, it is well resolved in that respect. Uh, you, you can predict what the velocity is, you can predict what the mass is within, depending on your simulation, maybe a factor of two or better. Uh, but, but it's not, but it's, uh, when you get to the velocities of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 C, where people have predicted some UV emission from the outflows, that part is uh, less, less uh, certain, I would say. But Does sorry, just to, just to follow up, do you have you seen this in your simulations? Uh, I have seen things up to like 0.7 C, mm -hmm. uh, but it's very resolution dependent in uh, grid simulations. 
uh, the, the, the simulations I've shown kind of the, you know, the most evidence for this are particle based simulations where uh, resolving a small amount of matter is a little bit easier, but it's still, a, it's still based on a very small number of particles overall. So I think that it would be nice to be able to, uh, to get higher resolution uh, um, coverage of, of these high velocity R flows to be sure that they actually do, uh, that they do exist and what the properties are, I think. But I, I don't see the point 0.9C in my simulations, but that might be because uh, of, of atmosphere effects in the uh, in the hydro simulations, right? We are not very good at treating high velocity, low density matter in grid based simulations. So I, 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 that doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't exist. Thank you. Okay, I see another question online. Uh, Luciano, go ahead. Thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you, Francois, for a nice talk. I was wondering about a thing you said uh, early on in, in the talk about neutrino annihilation in the in the funnel that you know it could be important for for the outflows there right. uh, you mentioned that this is uh, still unresolved or complicated to include in the simulations Can, mm -hmm. could you expand a little bit on that right yeah so yeah so, so when i talk about pair annihilation i mostly mean things can you see my pointer yeah Fine. okay <laughs> uh so i mostly uh mean things that will happen in this region here uh, where you have neutrinos, neutrinos and antineutrinos coming from various parts of the hot regions and then annihilating here. Um, if you want to do that in the moment scheme, it's going to be very inaccurate uh, because uh, the uh, annihilation rate is very dependent on the, the angle between the two, the direction of propagation of the two neutrinos. And the angle between the two neutrinos in the moment scheme is very poorly uh, resolved, especially in the polar regions where you get all of those colliding beam of neutrinos that you know behave unphysically. Uh, so that's one issue in the so that's the issue in the two moment scheme is that th this is specifically something that the two moment scheme is going to have a problem with uh, because of the high dependence in the uh, relative direction of propagation of the neutrinos. In the Monte Carlo scheme, in theory, uh, you actually have that information, but in the Monte Carlo schemes that we are currently using. We only have a few packets per cell in these regions at best. And so the accuracy with which we can reconstruct the uh, annihilation rate is uh, uncertain. Uh, I mean, I, I have honestly only run one Monte Carlo simulation with pair annihilation so far. Uh, and I'm, uh, so I, I don't have a very good handle on what kind of error we are making at this point. I haven't even a, a convergence study or anything like that. I know I, know I can do it technically, uh, but I don't have an idea of how well I can resolve the effect at this point. The, the potential saving grace is that this is an effect that is going to average over many, many interactions over the length of the simulation. And so maybe even though I only have a few packets per cell, uh, if I actually average over all of the packets that a, that a single packet will encounter over its evolution, it's going to be reasonable. But I'm not sure that, that is true at this, at this moment. Does that answer your question or not? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I Just a quick follow up, like if you, uh, get like a you know some sort of jet magnetized jet. I guess the energetic of that will be much uh, higher than you know the contribution of of this uh, neutrino uh, pair annihilation, right? So you know maybe uh, it's yeah. Uh, at least if you look at the most uh, energetic short GRBs, that's true. So for some of, but you can still have. I mean, people have said that you can actually get of the order of a few percent of the total neutrino luminosity. Uh, redeposited in the uh, polar regions through pair annihilation. And so for the brightest uh, systems where you can get 10 to the 54 ergs per second initially, that would be 10 to the 52 ergs per second initially deposited in the uh, polar region, which at that point is not a negligible amount of, of energy. It could be enough at least to help clear out the regions of matter uh, and actually create a, you know, a kind of hard low density region there. Uh, it is typically, I mean, According to our most recent estimates, it is probably not likely to explain the energy of the most energetic short gamma ray bursts. But at, at some point, I mean, pair annihilation was proposed as a, and, you know, as, as a mechanism for the production of short gamma ray bursts. And on, on some of the lower energy one, it remains technically possible. I see. Thank you. Okay. Any last question in the room? Okay. If not, Francois is around tomorrow, Wednesday. Feel free to sign up to meet with him. He will also uh, give an informal talk in this room, 3 p.m. tomorrow. Just about
much more technical detail than simulation. I guess I start with this last last six slides. <laughs> <laughs> and talk about transport, yeah. <laughs> I think we get fun. <laughs>